start. All right, hello everyone. I see some people are starting to hop on the webinar here. Um, just a reminder before we get started with the presentation that any questions throughout, you guys can feel free to throw in the Q&A box and in the chat box. Um, we'll talk about some really cool stuff that I'm sure you'll have questions on. Um, and then we'll go ahead and Eric will answer those questions for everyone at the end. Um, but we're gonna give everyone just a few more minutes to trickle on here. I see some people are joining us. Um, yeah, and we're happy to have you guys join us today. If you guys also wanted to, um, just while we're waiting for anyone extra to get on here, you guys can comment where you're from in the, in the comments as well. Well, I'll start with where I'm from, Lindsay. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, our office is located in Los Alamos, New Mexico, but I'm calling in from my home office in beautiful Hood River, Oregon, um, which is finally a beautiful day. We've had a pretty rainy spring, but beautiful sunny day today. So, same here. Yeah. We're in uh, we're in Michigan, um, and today is they said it was going to rain, but it's actually really sunny outside, um, and we've also had a super rainy start to. Yeah. spring but also going into coming into summer too so um also working at home and everything so and i'm sure a lot of you guys <laughs> on here either work remotely or have worked remotely um so we're always uh prefacing you know with these webinars that kind of become the norm so continue to look out for these from from ub grow um and i do see quite a few people actually just hopped on again um just a reminder um any questions you have throughout the presentation, feel free to throw them in the chat box and the Q and A. Um, otherwise, I think let's see what time it is. We'll give them a few more seconds. Otherwise, um, I think we're good to get started. Um, I'll kind of start by prefacing who I am, who Thrive Pop is. Um, I'm Lindsay Griffith. I work for Thrive Pop, a digital marketing agency. We do a lot of marketing for uh, the agricultural industry. Host a lot of webinars. I do a lot. Of webinars with uh, Maximum Yield, Cannabis Summit, um, MJ uh, Biz Daily, and you've probably seen some of my writing in um, uh, Cannabis Marketing Association, amongst some other things. So um, I'm really happy to have you guys joining me as I sit down with Eric um, as they present uh, some cool topics with uh, UB Grow, um, Greenhouse Cultivation, the Solution to Feeding the Planet. So Eric, I'm going to let you get into all about you, what you do for UB yeah. Grow, and just about UB Grow in general. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. So I'm Eric Moody. I'm the director of sales for UV Grow. Um, and just so everybody understands, if, if anybody follows us online or sees some of our stuff, UV Grow is a division of a parent company called Ubiquity. Ubiquity stands for Ubiquitous Quantum Dots. So Ubiquity is a, um, a tech company specializing in nanotechnology, specifically quantum dots. And quantum dots are used in, in the world today in things like your displays, like Samsung has a of what they call QLED. It's a quantum lot, quantum dot LED screen. So it helps make colors more vibrant. And one of the things that we can do with quantum dots and our specific safe quantum dots, um, non-toxic is what I mean by safe, because some of the ones in your TV screens do have some toxic metals in them, but we do not use those. So what they're really known for is being able to manipulate light. So we have with our parent company, Ubiquity, a couple of different avenues where we're still kind of in the infancy of quantum dot technology and where we could take that technology. So our company is doing anything from our agricultural product that is UV Grow, um, which I'll talk a little more about on this. And then anything from solar windows where we're redirecting light and windows to collect solar power and generate power to security inks um, that can only be seen under specific spectrum of light. So there's a lot of different technologies that can be used with quantum dots. So, very new technology, but our first and our, our biggest product that we're producing right now is specifically for horticulture. And it's to help um, produce fruit, food more sustainably. Everything that our company is based around is about sustainable living. Mm -hmm. So part of that is greenhouse cultivation. And today's, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how greenhouses are kind of that solution, if you will, for feeding the planet as our population keeps growing. So we can go ahead and start now. All right. Awesome. <clears throat> so if greenhouses are the solution, like we said in the title, what is the problem? The problem is industrial field agricultural practices and their corresponding land use 
that threaten the biodiversity and the sustainability and quality of life on Earth. Um, a lot in that sentence to take away, but the reality of it is, and we'll talk a little bit as this presentation goes on or this webinar goes on, but field crops are, um, are, are, are not an efficient way of growing. You think about uh, the food industry for years, whether it's regional within this country, the United States on its own, all of North America, or just around the world, um, our population is used to eating and sustaining themselves on what they can grow in their region. But now as our tastes have changed and our population has grown, we are now you know, producing crops in a field in central California and shipping them clear across the country. So less shelf life and a lot more cost to move. So we'll talk a little more about that as we go. We can go to the next slide. Cool. Awesome. So the impacts of industrial field agriculture. Um, the things that impact field agriculture are obviously weather and climate change. If you think about you know, our, our climate warming right now, we're seeing more droughts, more fires, um, more harsh weather as well. Weather can be a, a huge impact on growth. If you think about things like where I live here in Oregon, we have, um, it's a big, big orchard area for pears, mostly pear orchards for as far as I can see. We had a crazy late snowstorm. I've never seen it happen in mid-April, actually a little bit late April. We got snow that hit a ton of our orchards and freezing. These are orchards that are already blossoming. So there's a lot of fruit that's gonna be lost. Um, but the same thing can happen to any sort of supplies. You hear it in the Midwest with corn all the time, with droughts. And so these type of things obviously are, are huge in us helping feed our population. Our fresh water supply is always a topic. Um, and, and that's something that field agriculture uses a lot. And we'll talk a little more about that here shortly. And then also just having food locally. Um, local food supply can be very, very important to sustainability. It's got a longer shelf life, less waste. All of these things can, can help with, agri with producing food sustainably. Mm -hmm. We can go to the next slide. Okay. Um, just something too I wanted to touch on, Eric. It's true that indoor farming also contributes to a lot of this. Oh, state sure. problems for with sustainability sure. as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So weather and climate change. Industrial agriculture accounts for 10% of all greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. That's a lot if you think about it. You know, most people think about greenhouse gas, they think of cars and factories and those type of things, but 10% just from industrial agriculture. Conventional soil management with nitrogen fertilizer applications result in the release of nitrous oxide and it accounts for 40% of these emissions. Natural gas digestion in animals releasing methane accounts for 30%. Um, that's another huge one that I look at when it comes to greenhouse agriculture is as our population is growing and growing and growing and there's so much meat consumption in our population that we are, you know, there's place acres and acres of the Amazon forest being cut down right now to grow cattle. Um, we can't sustain ourselves as a population on meat as much as we do right now. As you look into the future, and I'm not talking two, five, 10 years, I'm talking 50, 100, 200 years in the future, the way our population is growing at an exponential rate, we're going to have to rely more on, plant, on a plant-based diet, and we have to learn how to grow that sustainably. So that's a, a huge part of that when you think about um, livestock and livestock manure management, which accounts for 14%. Um, that's a big one to look at. Agricultural energy use, including powering machinery for you know, tractors on the, on the crop, the mechanized operations, food processing, and then obviously the transportation of food. Again, if you think about lettuces grown in Central California and shipping it all the way across to Kansas, um, that's a huge cost and a lot of fossil fuels burned. Mm -hmm. Go on. So freshwater for agriculture, this is a really big one. Industrial ag agriculture is the single largest consumer of water in the world by economic wow. sector, accounting for 70% of freshwater use. Wow, that's insane. Isn't it though? You don't think yeah. about that, right? I always thought it was just golf courses alone, but right. <laughs> <laughs> some irrigation use in agriculture is sustainable, but an estimated 15 to 35% of the irrigation withdrawals are unsustainable and cannot connect, continue without causing permanent damage to aquifers and other limited resources. And another thing to think about that too is um, the freshwater runoff. You know, you're, a lot of crops are, are, are watered through a sprinkling system. So there's a ton of it is just being lost in evaporation before it's even hitting the, hitting the ground. 
on the ground, a lot of it is running off. And that runoff that goes into our aquifers, into our rivers, streams, is usually also carrying a ton of the fertilizers we're using to grow our food. These are the type of things that are very um, damaging to our environment, obviously. Okay. In developed countries, the water footprint of food accounts for 92% of daily water use. That's a huge problem. So the solution obviously is water use efficiency, alternative water sources, efficient and localized irrigation systems. And we're gonna talk a little bit here in a minute about how greenhouses help with that as well. Can move on. So local food supply, issues of the global food supply. Consumers are becoming increasingly disconnected from their sources of food and wealth inequality disproportionately affects access by certain demographics and minorities. So think outside of even just here in the US, but as food has to be shipped in certain areas and there's regions of the world that are desert, regions of the world that are very cold, um, you know, snow cover for so long, we have to be able to feed our populations that are living there. So not having food grown locally there is, is really separating people from it. And then the amount of waste to get the food there, the short shelf life, those type of things. I can't stress that one enough. Um, I read an article recently that talked about the shelf life of foods and how when the, the food is already sitting on a truck and taking days and days and days to get to a location, so much of it is wasted before it's ever even consumed by the, the population in that area. Insane. So the, the pros of the local food supplier, local food production can reconnect consumers with their food. Um, protect against global supply shortages and shipping delays, and the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by reducing food miles. So I want to talk about each of those in a little bit. Um, local food production, again, what we just talked about with the amount of waste, but the other part of it is when you start building these local greenhouses in communities, then it's also offering up more jobs. The food is hitting the shelf fresher. It's got the longer shelf life. So again, people are just more connected with their food locally. The, you look at where we are in the world right now, we've got a war going on in Europe, gas prices through the roof. These are the type of things that a local supply for a food source can help fight. And then obviously the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions is just the no brainer, right? Like shipping food across the country just doesn't make any sense. No. So much of our produce and our fruit comes into the United States from Mexico. I was just in Cretro, Mexico for Green Tech don't know if anybody on the call was there. It was a great show and a beautiful, beautiful city. And almost every grower I talked to said anywhere from 80 to 90% of what they produce is being shipped in the United States. Oh, wow. It's just amazing to me to think that much food is being produced outside of our own country. That's insane. Yeah. So the shift to greenhouses with increased awareness of industrial field agriculture on the planet, both individual farmers and government policies are favoring the shift to greenhouse cultivation. It's a no-brainer, right? And you see it in the news all the time. Um, there's so much right now pushing to, there's companies like App Harvest that are doing so much and these big greenhouse complexes that are starting to go around into our different regions. Um, in my, my past experiences, I worked with a horticultural lighting company and we worked with some of the biggest greenhouse growers in the country. And it was amazing to see these massive greenhouse complexes from um, regions in Canada, around Toronto, New York, all of these areas where, you know, they had these very, very cold winters. But now with these big greenhouses going in, they're able to produce food year round locally. Mm -hmm. So the primary benefit of greenhouse cultivation is the protection of crops from hazards, such as adverse weather, pests and diseases. Pro providing an enclosed growing area prevents crops from suffering damage from extreme climate related events, such as sudden changes in temperature, droughts, et cetera. I talked about this even here with the orchards and what we just went through where I live, um, but these things happen all the time, all over the world. Anything from locusts to uh, storms to you name it, all of these things um, we're constantly battling when we have agriculture or food-based um, agriculture outside. Greenhouses can produce 20 to 50 times more yield per acre than a conventional field agriculture while using 10% as much water. Like that is huge numbers. To be able to produce 20 to 50 times more, I mean, just think of tomatoes alone, right? If you've ever been in a tomato greenhouse, big tall vine crop, so many tomatoes produced right there. When they take tomatoes and try to produce tomatoes in the field, and yes, it is still done in this country, it is 
you, you can do 50 times. That's where that 50 times comes from is your tomato greenhouses. It's really amazing. And, and <laughs> using 10% as much water. I think that stat kind of just totally encompasses the problem that we listed earlier in the presentation of yeah. how, you know, we have to solve this issue of water supply and we have to grow more. That yeah, stat literally sure. switching to greenhouse covers both of that. So that's a very interesting statistic for sure. Yeah, for sure. For sure. We can go on. So where are greenhouses most efficient? Obviously we can control temperature. Um, that said, there are regions of our country. I've got a customer in the Mideast that's in the middle of the desert. They, because of the heat that they battle, even in their greenhouse, they're able, they're only able to produce um, food for nine months out of the year. But in a field where he lives, they, they don't hardly get a crop. I mean, it's super hot desert. So that's still a huge step forward. And they're able to produce food nine to 10 months, he told me, a year in an area of the world that no food was being produced before everything was being shipped in. Um, humidity can be controlled. Optimizing sunlight, which is what UbiGro does. I'll talk about that in a little bit, but we can optimize the light coming into the greenhouse. Obviously, water, we just talked about one of the biggest ones. We can control our nutrients, our nutrient runoff, which is huge. We can control our soils. A lot of plants are not grown in actual soils, as I'm sure everybody knows. Um, produce year round. And then obviously the automation and technology. You think about the amount of labor for field production, and then you're producing 20 to 50 times more of that per square meter, acre, whatever. Um, we can also, through technology and greenhouses, reduce the amount of labor to produce all of that food. But drip irrigation systems in greenhouses are, are a huge key in um, greenhouse production being more sustainable. We can, there, there's no surface runoff. We can recirculate the water. When we recirculate the water with the nutrients in it, we are also recirculating the nutrients. So much, much more efficient to grow that way. Awesome. Go to that. I also want to preface too, I already see that there are questions coming in. Um, if you guys have any questions throughout the presentation, you know, just keep them dropping below and um, in the Q&A box, and then we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Mm -hmm. But I already see some people have some cool questions. So um, I'll let you continue on. Hey, um, another one that people ask me a lot about, especially in my days with the horticultural lighting company I was with in my past, is vertical farming. Why not in these big areas grow um, indoors, you know, take a warehouse, grow indoors. But the problem with that, while it does localize our food production, it's a heavy, heavy reliance on electrical lighting when all of your um, light sources coming from electrical lighting, even LEDs, it's still a lot of power to grow indoors. The high energy costs compared to sunlit greenhouses, obviously, and the capital cost to build an indoor growth system versus in a greenhouse can be two times or even more higher than that of the greenhouse. And your cost per pound of delivered produce because of these costs can run 30% higher. One of the things I have seen that I really like is some of you have seen the long, uh, the tall um, lettuce towers and, and obviously vine crops grow vertically, but that hybrid of approach of growing vertically inside a greenhouse, I think takes advantage of all of this. It takes advantage of the efficiencies per square foot by growing vertical, just like you would indoors, but we can maximize sunlight with it as well. And one of the ways to do that with the vertical style growing in a greenhouse is through light diffusion, getting light really diffused in there. So clear glass with no light diffusion qualities, sunlight puts straight down, you get big shadowing. But if you have a good diffusion on your greenhouse or even our UbiGrow product has very high light diffusion qualities, that really helps getting light bounce around in there. You see less shadowing, your shadows look kind of fuzzy and that's because photons are bouncing around. These things can be utilized in a greenhouse to make them more efficient and to grow vertically. Awesome. Which we kind of mentioned some of these, but you know, as a recap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So yes. Um, our quantum dot technology is a nanotechnology. We boost yield without electricity. Installation is easy. It is a, um, it's a product that can be put in after you've had your greenhouse up for a long time. It does last four to six years inside a greenhouse. And it's also used to complement lighting. Um, one of the things our product cannot do is extend daylight. So we can't extend and increase lighting on both ends of the day we really optimize sunlight. And what I mean by that is our quantum dot technology, it doesn't filter any part of the light out. We actually change the light spectrum. So 
when sunlight hits our quantum dots, we're able to, depending on, and we can shift this, by the way, we can change, like right now in this picture, you see our orange UV growth. We can shift it to look more red, or we can shift it more towards the green end of the spectrum. But really what we're doing is we're taking um, the photons that hit our quantum dots, the, the short wavelength photons of UV light outside of PAR, outside of your photosynthetic active radiation, that real short wavelength, our quantum dots are absorbing that and re-emitting it. So they are luminescent, they glow. So our UV growth film does glow and they re-emit it in a longer wavelength that puts them around targeting right at about 605 to 620 nanometers, which looks very orange to our eyes, but it's very red end of the spectrum. And the red end of our McCree curve, which shows the most efficient part of the light spectrum is red. It's right around that 605 to 620. And and as sunlight goes through that, we also increase all the way down through to far red, about 750 nanometers. We are increasing a little bit of that as well. So taking out almost 50% of UV light, we are still leaving some UV. We know UV is important. Um, we do take out a little bit of the blue sunlight on its own, depending on where you're on the world on average has over 30% blue light in our sun spectrum. Plants are only utilizing up to about half of that before they have a saturation of blue light. So we pull a little bit of that blue light and all of that is converted. It's not filtered out. It's converted over increasing the red end of the spectrum. So it's pretty exciting technology for someone like myself coming from the lighting world. When I saw what this technology could do, I, I, I've watched this company for a couple of years and uh, was always excited about it. So anyway, pretty neat technology. Yeah, I can say too, um, if you guys go ahead and you look at their Instagram account, it's like at UV Grow, um, you can actually see a ton of cool pictures of the product literally just glowing. Like it looks so cool. There's a lot of really cool shots from the greenhouse from afar that it just, it's just glowing and it's glowing right next to the sun on the horizon. And it, it just looks awesome as well as it, sure. you know, help and boost yields. And I know that they also have um, some different statistics and stuff on there, but it's pretty cool looking. Yeah, yeah for sure. For sure. Yeah. All right. Well, that was went by quick. Jeez. Yeah. I talked way too fast. I guess. No, <laughs> I think it was super concise. I think we talked about some very important issues today as well. And I appreciate mm -hmm. everyone, you know, I'm sure the whole team does getting on this presentation and recognizing, you know, the issue of food security um, and, you know, searching for a solution that fits best for you and how we discussed today, how greenhouses seem to be one of the most sustainable solutions for that. Um, and I do see we have some awesome questions. Um, before I get to those two, I just wanted to preface, we do have other webinars that we've done as well. Um, those should be up on ubgrow.com as well as the YouTube channel. Um, also tackling different issues with greenhouses with light diffusion in general, um, just horticultural, mm -hmm. you know, lighting and ag and everything about that. So if you guys head to either of those, you could check those out as well. We plan on doing more in the future too. But before, let's see what kind of questions we have here. Perfect. Can you send the presentation? So actually right after this, what we'll do is we will send a recording of this video um, as well as a direct contact for Eric too um, in a massive email for everyone who's attended. So you guys will get all this, you guys will get all this information, you get the slides, you'll get um, a recording of the webinar as well. Um, it will also be up on our YouTube channel too, but um, we'll also put Eric's personal contact info in there, you know, to get, get in touch as well. But yes, so everyone will be getting a copy of this as well. So good info there. Um, will you grow allow me to not have to run my lights as much as during the day? Oh, that's a good question. I get asked that one a lot, actually. Um, the answer is a little bit yes and no. And if you're in an area, you know, a northern climate in the winter, you're, and you're already running your lights every day, we can't increase the overall par on your crop. We can increase the red light on your crop. But the flip side of that, the reason I say yes and no, is we do have growers that realize that during the, the day when the sun is higher in the sky, they're able to turn their lights off when they didn't in the past, and they're still seeing an increase in their yield. So they are not only getting an overall increase in their yield, but they are cutting back on some of their um, watt consumption for power. So it, it's, a, it's a balance and every grower is gonna be a little bit different. So it, I can't just say yes across the board, you can, but we do have some growers that are seeing that benefit and able to do it. Cool, I think Perfect. this question 
and actually kind of goes a little bit hand in hand with that one. Um, you mentioned that UV grow does not filter light, but converts UV to red light. How does that work? Yeah, um, I, I did talk about that a little bit on here. Um, it's really the, the quantum dot technology. So they are nano crystals almost, if you will. And the the, they're, they're baked in a, in a whole big process. Um, and I'm definitely not the chemical engineer that makes them, but what I do understand is we can, depending on, for layman's terms, how long we bake them, it changes the size of them. And that change in size, which by the way, that size is about 50,000 times smaller than the width of your human hair. <laughs> um, but we're able to change the size of them. And that change in size, if you think about it as kind of a round crystal, when a photon hits it, the short wavelength is really high energy and it's bouncing real fast. It's absorbed by the quantum dot. And when it emits it back out of the quantum dot, it has slowed it down. So it's making it wavelength longer. So it's not filtering it out. There's still the energy from that coming through, but it takes that UV and shifts it over to a longer wavelength. So pretty interesting technology. And it's the same thing that, like I said, is used in TV and certain TV screens to make colors more vibrant as well. Interesting. Cool. Yeah. It looks like we have one more question. Um, it says, you spoke a little about growing indoors with vertical farms. In large cities where there's no room for greenhouses, doesn't it make more sense to find a warehouse or container to grow locally? Oh, this would be a perfect question for Gotham Greens, who we've been talking to recently as well. Um, there are companies out there right now that are actually putting greenhouses on top of on rooftops. So they're putting them like on top of even grocery stores. So the produce is being grown on the roof and brought in. So they're building greenhouses. They're finding areas in these high population um, centers to build greenhouses. That said, um, yes, you know, in downtown New York City, most rooftops are filled with chillers and stuff like that. You're not going to find a spot to put a greenhouse on a, you know, a tall, tall office building or something. So it's still much better to be, even if you're just outside that city, even if you're just an hour drive outside the city and found area for a greenhouse would be much more sustainable than growing it clear out in Kansas from New York or even California or, or further away. So mm -hmm. the, we're definitely doing a good job as a society building these greenhouses as close as we can. But I would say I've seen areas, I've seen areas in Alaska where they are growing um, in containers in a parking lot. No. And, you know, they don't have a lot of sunlight and most of the year a greenhouse would be covered with snow and not getting light yet yeah, melts off pretty quick when you turn lights on. But again, you got to turn lights on and cause the power to melt it off. So there's definitely um, a, a place for that for sure. But uh, yeah, I still say I think the future is in the greenhouse, you know, can do so much more than you can indoors and and the cost of it again with 100 percent of your lighting coming from electric is, is never going to be the right answer, I don't think. Right. Um, we actually got another question that just came in. Can your tech be used to generate electricity while at the same time changing the color of sunlight? That's a great question. Um, so we are working with a company called Hellion right now that is developing specifically for a greenhouse. They, they do solar panels and they are developing a greenhouse glass that has their solar cells in it. So they are going to reduce some of the amount of light coming into the greenhouse because they're going to absorb it in the solar cells. Mm -hmm. But we can take the glass that is around that and have our quantum dots sandwich that in a laminate, sandwich in a laminate between the two panes of glass and optimize that sunlight that's coming through. So while it might be a little bit of reduced light, it'll at least be optimized to help you grow more. That's one way, but the other way is with our parent company, Ubiquity, we are working on solar windows. So the same thing, our quantum dots are sandwiched um, between laminate glass. Um, the glass becomes a waveguide and we're able to take parts of the sun spectrum and direct it to the edge of the glass. So the edges of the glass glow and then it's wrapped with solar cells in the window frame itself. So you don't actually see it. And we can make these windows be different colors depending on our quantum dots, if that's architecturally appealing, or we can make them look just a little bit tinted um, and that light is being directed to the perimeter of the window with solar cells in the frame. So we are able to generate power with that. Actually, we currently have a product now that we're generating just power locally as a retrofit window that's 
doing automated blinds, making them go up and down. There's, we've got one in a local hotel I tried charging my phone with last week. So (laughs) it's pretty great. I know you, you just said too, how those windows also have that similar glow. Um, if you also, I know we plugged, uh, you know, talked about how I, if you look on UB goes grows Instagram, you could see a ton of cool shots of the film growing. Um, if you go yeah. to ubiquity's Instagram as well, there's a ton of cool yeah. shots of the windows glowing and it's, it's just really sure. awesome to see. Um, but yeah, we actually had another question come through. Can you reduce the heat that comes through the sun in warmer climates? Interesting. So our, our UV Grow film does offer a little bit of shade, um, and we are seeing very, very small numbers when we're looking at leaf temperature, very, very small, um, but good results where we have reduced leaf temperature by a small amount. It's been hit or miss, and it's been in different areas, but typically, no, our UV Grow product doesn't, doesn't tend to alter the climate in the, in the greenhouse much at all. Okay. Cool. And just a reminder too, I know one of the first questions was sending the slides. And obviously we also talked a lot about things that weren't uh, listed on the slide. So um, just a reminder too, that the recording will also be on our YouTube channel. We'll also send the YouTube video along with the email follow-up as well. So you guys have that. So you can hear everything that we discussed and all the questions we answered too. Um, but that looks like that is the last question. So wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Once again, just keep an eye on your inbox and look for an email follow-up from the team. Um, give right. UB Grow Ubiquity a follow on Instagram, catch them on LinkedIn, um, posting a lot of really awesome articles about sustainability um, and ways that we can change the future. So I um, want to thank everyone for joining and we'll see you on the next one. Bye guys. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Bye.